Welcome. We are going to quickly talk about the pharmacokinetics of digoxin. I'm going to go through several drugs. Basically, I'm going to go through some standard issues with every drug and how I kind of attack each drug as I learn try to learn something about it. I don't memorize a lot of stuff. I my brain can't hold too much information. So, I try to just think about things in a very systematic way. And so I'm going to introduce you to the way I go about learning about drugs. So we're going to talk about digoxin first. All right. First of all, um, what are the indications for digoxin? Well, digoxin is used usually for two different things. It can be used as a positive inotrope for um, CHF. So increasing the force with which the heart pumps. Um, to try to improve cardiac output for people that have cystic, or have uh, congestive heart failure. Or as a negative chronotrope to slow the conduction of the heart, slow the conduction through the AV node um, when you have atrial fibrillation. You know, when patients have atrial fibrillation, their heart is beating wildly in the atrium. Uh, and as you know, the, the heartbeat will then conduct down from the atria, down through the AV node, um, and then it's slowed, the conduction is slowed in the AV node, so you have two pumps, bump, 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 bump. The first bump being the emptying of the atrium or the contraction of the atrium, and the second, the contraction of the ventricles. And that delay is the conduction through the AV node. So what digoxin does is slow conduction through the AV node. And we use it to um, what I call protect the ventricles when somebody has atrial fibrillation. So if the electrical activity is going crazy in the atrium, you can live with that. But what you can't live is if that crazy electrical activity transfers to the ventricles. So by slowing the conduction through the AV node, you can protect the ventricles from that ventricular crazy activity. Um, so those are the two uses, and we'll find out soon that there's two different therapeutic ranges. I mean, there are two different things you're doing, right? With the CHF, you're trying to get um, a better uh, pump cardiac output, and with the... Um, uh, atrial fibrillation protection of the ventricles, we're trying to make sure we slow the AV node enough. So um, how does digoxin work? Well, digoxin is an ATPase um, pump inhibitor, and I'm not going to go too much into that, but you, you guys know how that works. But first thing I do when I'm looking at a new drug is what am I going to be using for and how does it work? Because I need to be able to monitor that. In the, to be able to know what I'm looking for as far as my therapeutic goals and what side effects I might expect. Then, of course, you know, I always look at clearance first. I guess that's just because I think clearance is usually paramount for answering a lot of other questions. So the first thing I ask with clearance is, what are the major organs of clearance? Well, in this case, the FE is 0.75, so that means 75% of it will end up in the kidney or in the urine as unchanged parent drug, which means it's 75% cleared by the kidneys, which means it's 25% cleared by something else. Uh, in this case, it's probably uh, non-renal or hepatic. So this equation here is what we can use to determine a patient's clearance. It's not surprising that this is the renal portion and this is the non-renal portion. The renal portion is a function of the person's creatinine clearance. That shouldn't be surprising to anyone. So you multiply 1.303 times whatever their creatinine clearance is. This is in mils per minute, plus whatever you're going to guess their non-real clearance is. This is just a guess, remember, a place to start. The non-real clearance would uh, be based upon this little chart here. If they have no heart failure or New York Heart Association cla classification one or two heart failure, you give them 40 mils per minute for their non-renal clearance. If they have more severe heart failure, class three or four, you half that, so you only give them 20 mils per minute. So you add the renal and the non-renal portion up and that gives you your total body clearance. 
I also want you to know that it is a P glycoprotein substrate for renal um, at the, in the kidney. And that probably, there's probably drug interactions there that we don't describe very well yet. It also undergoes enterohepatic recirculation. Remember what that means is that the drug is um, pumped into the bile and out through the gall, stored in the gallbladder and then out back into the, into the small intestine where the drug can then be either go out in the feces or be reabsorbed again and uh, go into the bloodstream and go through the whole process again. Okay, so we talked about the clearance. We know it's primarily cleared by the kidneys, so we're going to be concerned about renal failure. Um, volume and binding. This is a very large volume of distribution, right? Seven liters per kilogram. It does not distribute into the fat, therefore we use ideal body weight if we're over, if you're considered, your patient's considered obese. Um, if you have uh, some renal impairment, then we use this fudge factor here because we found that um, renal impairment affects volume. Now, why would that be? Um, we talked about that just last month, I think. There's lots of, because there's binding changes, right? The drug will move in different places um, when you have uh, a renal impairment because of, probably because of, because of binding changes. So um, you use this fudge factor. So you would multiply 298 times the creatinine clearance in mils per minute, all these fudge factors. And then what their weight is, and this is in kilograms, over 70 kilograms. So this is sort of a weight adjustment. Calculate it. So if they have renal impairment, you have to, you can't just use seven liters per kilogram. You have to use this uh, equation to determine their volume.